So my name is Chris Schemba. I am a volunteer with the uh, PMI Switzerland Zurich events chapter uh, team. Uh, welcome to our event. I would ask you to please say hello and let us know from which part of the world uh, you are joining us. A Zoom poll should pop up on your window right now. So please uh, click. We'll give you uh, five more seconds to answer the poll, and then we will look at the results. So let's see what we have. So, uh, ooh, it seems we have many people from Switzerland, a few other European countries, no North Americans. That's unfortunate. But let's uh, let's go with what we have. So, so let's uh, let's proceed, please. So some ground rules before we start, all attendees will be muted during the session. All interactions will be via the chat and the Q&A section, which you can access at the bottom of the screen. Uh, this session will be recorded and then published on the PMI Switzerland YouTube channel. Uh, if you are having difficulty with Zoom, uh, you can make sure that you have the latest update. Uh, and if you have additional technical problems, you can also message the host via the Zoom chat feature. Uh, there will be uh, Zoom and Slido polls during this session, and we would hope that everyone can participate. Uh, you can post questions in the Q&A section within Zoom. The speaker will give the talk in a series of steps, and after each step, there will be uh, an opportunity for him to answer questions. You are welcome to add questions at, at any point. Answers to questions that cannot be answered during the event as well as the workshop slides will be sent in an email after the event. So as everything is now online, PMI Switzerland is also online. And please do not forget to look for us on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you would like to post anything on our social media platforms, please contact the social media team. I will now hand over the virtual microphone to Stefan uh, Wessenmeyer, our Vice President of Events for PMI Switzerland. Yes, hello, good evening, everyone. I hope you have a good day and you are very relaxed for this now very challenging, but very also very informative experience talk from Martin, our old fellow, not, not, not say old, our long fellow from PMI Switzerland. I just want to point you for one minute to our next event that happens on the 11th of February, also virtual, unfortunately. It's about our annual members meeting. So this big event that we have every year, it's also online this year, so it's not what we wish and it's not the chance to welcome all of you as, us as usual. But on the other side, it's a very special event for me, for our new board, and for all of our guests, we will talk about the future of work. And we think the future of work is human. You all know and you all realize the changes currently that we have in our life, in our business. We will talk about where is the, the road going to, what is the effect for us in personal life, but also what we will find as a challenge in the future of, as a project manager. We will do it in the, in the way of a panel discussion. We will have Al Saitu. He is a very long PMI board member and a very experienced one from the States. We will have Sarina Benain from CITA, from Switzerland. And we will have Luca Gambini from Sunrise in Switzerland. So it's not only that we will talk about the theory that is presented by Al, but we will also see what is the real effect to our business and especially to the telecommunication part. So please come to our webpage, register for yourself. It's free for every member. And join us for the annual members meeting 2011, uh, 2021. We will have this interesting talk on the panel and some surprises. It's 20 year PMI Switzerland, so maybe there's something special. Looking forward to meet you there and now have a good evening, very informative informations 
and fun. Goodbye and thank you. So thank you very much, Stefan. And now we get to the main event. So Martin Harry. Uh, Martin is currently a senior project officer at SIX. He joins us today with 30 years of project knowledge and experience earned in the consulting and financial services sectors, where Martin has managed offices, projects, and portfolios with budgets up to 600 million francs per year. So Martin is quite accomplished at project management in the professional space, but he loves it so much that he also invests his free time in project management and specifically in our Swiss PMI chapter. Martin is actually a founding member of PMI Switzerland, and he has been an ever-present volunteer since the beginning, having served in the past as a member of the board, member of the elections committee, and also as the chapter president. Martin is currently the coordinator of our corporate network and co-lead for the 2021 Swiss Project Management Conference. So we are very fortunate to welcome, uh, to have Martin speaking with us today, and I would welcome him very much to proceed with his talk about, about balancing agile and traditional project management strategies. Martin. Chris, thank you very much. Um, before I introduce myself or say uh, start the presentation, it was 60 million, not 600 million. Let's, let's not exaggerate. Um, but thank you very much for the very nice introduction. Uh, Chris, you said this so nicely. I think next time somebody is going to say such nice words about me is going to be at my funeral. Um, I uh, would like to start with a little disclaimer. I hope technology holds because I had all kind of weird technical problems in preparing that presentation. Uh, just yesterday at exactly that time, our Jira server of the company was out for 30 minutes. Um, and it reminded me very much of that Dilbert cartoon. Um, I really hope that today I'm not visited by the dark angel of product demos. Uh, if that should be the case, I have a very good team that is going to help me back, get back online. I am very impressed by the number of people that are interested in that topic. I thought it's a rather you know, technical thing. It's, um, it's about methodology. But I see that we have over 120 people attending. I would like to know a bit more about who I'm talking to. So we prepared a Slido survey. Um, to participate, please open a web browser, enter slido.com and enter that code. Or you can also take a mobile device uh, take a photo of that QR code and then it will open the website or the app if you have it installed. And Pia is also had just posted the link in the, um, in the chat. I have three questions for you. And question number one, and I'm going to bring this up on the screen. Just a second. Yes. Okay. Question number one is what type of projects are you usually working in? Hybrid, traditional, agile, or different types of project? Okay. I'm actually quite surprised. Most people are working in hybrid projects. I was expecting many more in pure agile. But well, that's very interesting. Good. Thank you very much. So I think I think I know why you attended, and I hope uh, that after that presentation, you will say that you um, you learn something that you can apply in your project. Let's move on to the next question. I would like to know what tools that you are using that you are using to manage your tasks in the project: Excel, Project Jira, or something else. Okay. Interesting. Still many people that work with Microsoft Project. Jira seems to be the number one. Okay. Thank you very much. That's interesting. And my last question is actually more a bit of a fun question. And that is, do you know why the Gantt chart is called the Gantt this way? 
because it was designed by Henry Gant or because it's an abbreviation? Okay, good. Let's stop here. I see that most people paid attention in their project management training. The Gantt chart was actually designed by Henry L. Gantt in uh, somewhere between 1910 and 1950. So it's quite an old and traditional um, tool. So let me move this out. And sorry, that was the wrong one. Okay. So why do I even, well, what, what motivated me to give that presentation? There, there are several reasons. Um, the main reason is that working in a badly scheduled project is just no fun. I once was in a project where the vendor was uh, delayed quite seriously and we had to extend the project and that cost us um, about 5 million Swiss francs and it cost the vendor probably about 10 million Swiss francs and well, you can imagine that was definitely no fun for project management on both sides. By the way, I will use the term uh, schedule and not plan, because plan means planning every dimension of the project while schedule focuses on the dimension of time. And the second reason why I wanted to give that presentation is because some people can be very dogmatic about methodologies. They almost use it as a law. And that applies for people in traditional project management as well as people in agile project management. Um, I was at Credit Suisse when this IT department reached CMMI level three, and that was really a, a bureaucratic nightmare. Since then, CMMI for me is a four letter word. But then there are also the, the agile extremists, and I call them the agile Taliban. You know, they, are, they will send you a link to the Agile Manifesto at any possible occasion. And they will thing, say things like, uh, no, we can't tell you when we are going to be done with this uh, functionality because we are Agile. Or they will tell you, uh, you cannot tell us what we have to do because we are a self-managing team, we are Agile. And guys, I really wish I, I, I was making fun but I'm serious. I've really heard this from these agile, from these agilistas. And the third reason is, um, well, you know, back in the days when you became a project manager, you were given an, uh, a license for MS Project. At best, you were also sent to a training. And um, I was a trainer for Microsoft Project um, when I worked at Teddy Swiss. And my experience is that most people struggle with that tool and it's also not suitable for many projects. Now I have to be fair, um, uh, I know my, my knowledge with MS Project stopped at version 2010. I know that the tool has evolved. I've recently seen a presentation of Project 365, but my impression was that it is still, you know, it, in its heart is still a, a project scheduling tool for plan-driven projects. And eventually, you know, as soon as, when you're working in large projects, you know, like the ones where I'm working in, then you will have hundreds or even thousands of tasks. By the time that project that I'm going to talk about will be complete, we'll probably have completed something between three and 4,000 tasks. How do you manage such a large number without getting completely lost? And lastly, I, I'm a traditionally trained and experienced project manager, um, but Agile has recently added very valuable practices to my toolbox. And uh, I think in combining the toolboxes, um, you, can really, you can really gain a lot. Let me say a few words about the company that I work for. Um, it's six, was, it's, most of you are from Switzerland, so you've at least seen the logo, heard the name. Maybe you don't always know what we do. So we are a company with about two and a half, two and a half thousand employees, mainly in Switzerland, but also abroad. Our uh, shareholders are the banks in Switzerland, so we are not publicly listed. 
and we provide services to the capital market. And these services are in these dimensions. So we operate the Swiss Stock Exchange. We recently bought the Spanish Stock Exchange. We are going to very soon launch a digital, stock, digital exchange. And we are also active in post trading. Post trading is what happens after the trade when the different trades are being processed. Then we do banking services, um, so cash management, ATMs, e-bill, Twint is a, a sixth product, and we are also active in uh, financial information. And here are a few numbers to, from our corporate presentation, mainly to impress you, but also to give you um, bit of an impression of that we are really in the in the numbers business and I highlighted the number down here in red because um, the my, my project is working on the system which is handling these numbers of clearing transactions clearing is part of post trading I'm now going to say a few words about my project, and I don't know if any of our legal guys are watching this. Um, don't panic, so I'm not going to tell anything. I'm not going to share any company secrets. Uh, the fact that we are having this project is, is known to, in the financial market. And I'm also going to show you some live data from our project Jira. Uh, nothing of that is confidential in any way. It's pretty banal uh, project tasks. The only thing I had to hide are the, uh, the names of our uh, team members. So this is the, the, the project. It is called the new clearing platform project. The objective is to replace uh, clearing functionality in two legacy systems with a standard solution that we are buying from a market leader in that domain from NASDAQ Sweden. We started in 2018. We're going to have a first go live this year and a second one next year. As we are buying a package, uh, most IT development is done by our vendor, but we have about 15 project streams for integration and various other topics. The budget is above 20 million and there are about 50 people involved. Most of them are working part-time on that project. And here's the old chart. So um, you see that we are even under supervision of the Swiss regulators. Then up here is my little box. We have various streams for specialist streams like the risk modeling, business analysis, the, the four streams here, client interface, data reference, settlement engine, risk engine, are our own development or integration development. Two of these streams or two of these um, functions have even been developed offshore. And then we have various other disciplines. And then, of course, we have the, the supplier that the various teams are interacting with. Now, now if you consider this, you know, regulated, um, we are replacing a legacy application. We are buying a package. Um, most resources are part-time on the project. Then this is a classic case for a plan-driven project. You know? So we don't have interdisciplinary scrum teams. But nevertheless, we try to do this project in an agile way. And uh, here's the history. At the beginning of the project, um, our first project manager was a, a young woman which had experience in Agile. And she said, well, we have 180 requirements for that system. So let's put these in the backlog. Let's put them in, uh, in priorities. Uh, let's set up a scrum board and sprints and let's move these 180 requirements through the scrum board sprint by sprint from left to right. And by the way, that whole agile thing was new to most of us. But very quickly, we, we realized that we had to do much more than develop software. I mean, if you, if you think back to the, the org chart, software development is the least of our concern. You know? So we have much more to do than develop software. 
And then we had a change of project manager. The first project manager went on maternity leave and new project manager came in, a very senior guy, very experienced in traditional project management. And he said, um, this is very interesting what you're doing here. So uh, Agile, new to me as well. So let me watch what you're doing. Um, but after a while he said, I'm not happy. You know, I'm, I'm not happy because I don't have an overview of what's going on. I, I don't see the timeline. I don't see what's next. So I want an MS project file, MS project schedule. And having been a trainer for Microsoft Project, I resisted um, and eventually, man, and when I told him, uh, I think we can do this in Jira, we can continue working with Jira and, and I can give you your Gantt chart. And he said, okay, I'll give you a few weeks. If you can convince me, that's fine. Otherwise I want my MS project. And um, just to illustrate, we are currently in Sprint 40. So obviously I have succeeded. I would now like to walk you through our um, management cycle, project management cycle. And um, our cycle has five steps. So we set up the schedule, we start the sprint, we execute the work, we close the sprint, have a demo, have a retro. Um, we con continuously refine the schedule and then we start the next sprint. And as Chris mentioned in the beginning, I'm now gonna walk you through these five steps. After every uh, step, I'm going to pause for Q&A. So don't wait until um, you know, we come to the Q&A section. If you have any questions, type them in uh, right away. By the way, um, where did I source the ideas for this approach? Um, I hold a few certifications, project management certifications, and I'm showing this, yeah, of course, also to show off a bit. By the way, I'm not the, the, uh, the one with the most certifications. I think we have in PMI people with seven or eight certifications, PMI certifications. So I'm a PMP since 20 years. I'm a scheduling professional, uh, very rare certification. There are only two of us in Switzerland. I mentioned I used to be an MS project trainer. I'm also, I have agile certifications and my goal for this year is to have the discipline agile certification. So I source the ideas from all of these different um, say bodies of knowledge. Yeah, that was already said, you know, so please type your question in uh, and um, okay. So number one, the step number one, setting up a schedule in JIRA. That step has three sub-steps. First of all, we need to define the schedule. We need to have something to put into the schedule. I need to prepare the tool. And then we put the information into the tool. Um, that might sound all very abstract. So let me show you the end result. And if I find the right window, just a second. Okay, so there we are, okay. So here's how the end result looks like in Jira. And I think you will agree with me that this looks very much like a Microsoft project. So we have our work breakdown structure on the left side we have our summary tasks. So it's structured by the streams that you saw in the org chart. We have our work packages. And then down here, we have our tasks. We can even have um, dependencies and milestones. And we have our timeline here. So this is what convinced the project manager to go with JIRA. Uh, to be honest, um, JIRA out of the box cannot do this. So you need an add-in. The add-in that we are using is called structure.gant. Um, I like structure.gant very much. It's very powerful, but there are other uh, Gantt add-ins to Jira as well. It doesn't have to be exactly this one.
So let me go through these three steps, defining the schedule. Um, so what we usually do is we start with the big milestones. In our project, we call them deliverables. Um, and I can, so we source these deliverables from two sources. First, we have a contract with, uh, with NASDAQ. Uh, NASDAQ being a very professional vendor, you know, they, they do this with our client. I'm going to show you an extract from our contract. And again, dear friends from legal, don't panic. This is absolutely nothing secret. This is the extract for the testing phase. So we agreed with NASDAQ the steps of the testing, like um, we propose an acceptance test plan, they review it, then we send an update, and then eventually we approve it. And we have, as I listed here, 111 such uh, deliverables in our contract. And then we went and uh, added our own activities here. You know, you saw the other screens in the uh, in the organization, the uh, whatever the, the the testing, the architecture, and so on, the infrastructure preparation. And so eventually, we have all these um, these deliverables, and then we start adding tasks to get to these deliverables. Um, I would like to, in the, in the, in my MS project days, you know, it was usually the project manager who would create that schedule in the tool, you know, so she or he would sit down with MS project and start typing in uh, this information and then share it with the team. And I would like to share a best practice for getting to, to a schedule that I like very much and I've used in several projects. And um, that uses Magic Charts. Now, Magic Charts is a brand name. So there are other such uh, similar products as well. Magic Charts are plastic flip charts which stick to any flat surface by electrostatic adhesion. So you don't need uh, sticky tape. And what we do is we, you know, plaster a, a wall in a meeting room with these uh, magic charts. We have a timeline here. We have the project streams here. And then we get the whole team in a room. Well, we, we will when all post, post COVID. And then um, collaboratively, we develop that, um, that, that schedule. And the cool thing about this is uh, you can wipe it off. You can wipe off the information, which you can do with a paper flip chart. And you can fold these flip charts, take them away, put them back at the wall in a different room. And um, so it's, it's a very flexible tool. I really like that very much. I once had a project where we went through eight rounds with these um, flip charts until we eventually had our, um, our, our schedule. And then you need to prepare the tool. So I mentioned here, you know, we use structure.gant. Structure um, what you need to do then in the tool is you need to set up a structure. So structure, new structure. You need to define how the structure is generated. So what is filtered, what's the hierarchy in the structure you need to define uh, sprints. Um, now that's standard JIRA functionality. I mean, most of you use JIRA, so you know that. And in our project, oops, yes. Uh, in our project, we have three week sprints. Uh, what needs to be decided is the issue hierarchy. How many levels do you want and how do you want to call it? So we have a three level um, hierarchy we have project work package, well, actually stream, work package, and task. We even had special issue types created, which was completely unnecessary. You can just take issue type task, um, make it a parent, um, call it stream testing, for example, then have a child issue called um, work package acceptance test. And then under that, you have the other uh, tasks. Now, please note that we are not using agile terminology here. So we are not talking about um, features or epics or stories because we want to emphasize that it's something different. 
we had one stream which was really agile. So they worked with sprints and story points and all the nice things. They used um, epics and stories, but all the other um, streams, they use uh, tasks. Okay, and then once we have the information, we have the tool ready, we put the information into the tool. And that is quite some typing and linking work. Now let's let's pause for a minute and reflect if that approach is rather waterfall or is it rather agile? Now this is a rhetorical question, so don't type anything into the chat or in the Q and A. But if we compare, you know, pure agile and pure waterfall, in pure waterfall you would have a schedule with dates start and finish, the dates are independent of any rhythm, functionality is delivered in big chunks, and you have a somewhat detailed roadmap quite far out into the future. In pure agile, however, you have a backlog with priorities. The functionality is, defined, is delivered in a defined rhythm, so you would have uh, increments or sprints. Um, you have a constant and incremental delivery of functionality, and out in the future, you only have a high-level roadmap. So rhetorical question to you, do you think that here we are rather inspired by waterfall or by agile? I will give you my opinion. I think this is absolutely pure waterfall. The only new thing is that we have sprints and we use them for a very specific purpose. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Okay. Good, so then let me pause here. I see that we already have some questions in the Q&A. Um, I think I have about two, three minutes and then I should move on. Um, so thank you very much for the questions. Um, what kind of agile, so Robin asks, what kind of agile framework do you use? safe, scaled, agile. Um, actually for this, no. So this is, as I said, this is not um, really the application of any agile methodology. This is really pure waterfall. I'm also senior project officer in another project and that of sim similar size. And that project really is very agile. There we use the scaled agile framework. Um, can you recommend an online version of magic charts? Uh, that question is asked by Patrick. Um, actually, no, but what you might want to have a look at, and I don't want to make any advertisement for a specific product is, but is um, uh, there is a Swiss company called Rentouch and they have an, an app called, I think it's even called PI planning app, which um, uses big touch screens and where you can do a, um, a PI planning with that, uh, with that touch screen with distributed teams. And by the way, on the YouTube channel of Rentouch, you also find very interesting videos by um, Shane Harrison. Uh, he used to be a colleague of mine at KD Swiss, and he has a very interesting video series on PI planning therapy, which has nothing to do with what I'm talking about here, but I can really recommend these, um, these videos. Okay. I'm afraid there are many unanswered questions. As Chris mentioned in the beginning, I'm going to try to respond to the most relevant questions with the information, with the slides that you will be um, sent, uh, that will be sent to you. Okay. Right, step number two, prepare and start a sprint. Um, now we have all that information in JIRA and we, um, or I am going to load the relevant tasks into the scrum board into the next sprint. 
By the way, if I say I, then of course we have a, a project manager in that project, but he lets me do many things that normally in a project, a project manager would do. So I'm aware of the fact that not everybody has the luxury of having a, a project officer. Um, so if I say I do, in your case, that would be you do. Um, so for this, I'm using a different view on exactly the same information. And I'm using a list view. So I have built this list view, which sorts all the tasks which have been predefined by due date. And then I go through the tasks and I assign the, or assign the task within the next sprint to, uh, within the time frame of the next sprint to that sprint. You know, so I'm going to add the sprint information in the tasks. Um, and to be precise, we, I take the task for one sprint, but we realize over time that for deliverables, so for the really big information things, we need to look further ahead. So for the deliverables, I add the deliverables of the next two sprints. Now that's a rule of thumb. Uh, sometimes we add even more depending on what we would like to see on the scrum board. So the scrum board is like the, the information that we would like to discuss in our core team meeting. And then I go and start the sprint in JIRA and that is standard JIRA functionality. And that populates the scrum board. Now let's reflect, you know, is that rather waterfall or is it rather agile? Now in pure waterfall, the cycle that the project goes through is the meeting cycle, which is often weekly, tasks can have any duration. And the next task are defined by a predefined schedule, predefined date. In pure agile, your cycle is a software development or a release cycle. Stories must be complete at the end of the sprint and the next tasks are defined by, by priorities. And again here, you know, what do you think? Are we rather on the waterfall side or are we rather on the agile side? And so here's my take. I think again, we are very much on the waterfall side. You know, so, uh, the only reason why we use sprints is not to complete software that can be released, but to filter from that huge number of tasks, the ones which are currently of relevance. So we use it as kind of the, the window for looking ahead. Oops, okay. Let me have at the Q&A. Again, quite a lot of questions here. Okay, question from Johanna. Did you, whoops, did you include tasks like reporting, monitoring budget, stakeholder communication in the JIRA? Is everything in JIRA or did you leave something for other tools? Um, no, no, it, what is in JIRA is mostly, um, project related tasks, you know, that I don't forget to submit the monthly status report or to produce any monthly financial reports or prepare the um, project board meetings. Um, I don't need to see that in JIRA. What I do add in JIRA though is uh, actions coming from a project board meeting because that is very convenient for the people that are responsible for the actions because they have everything in one place. Question from Stefan, what's the most important not to be lost managing hundreds of tasks within JIRA? Oh, I like that question. Um, I think, as I said, you know, one option is, well, you need, you need to filter somehow. And you can filter, for example, by sprint, you know, that's our way of filtering out the tasks which are currently of relevance. I can also structure the tasks. So I can, um, we use the field component for the, um, for the stream. I can, and I have subboards for specific meetings, for example, the, the testers when they meet, 
we just filter out the, the tasks which are for the testers. And we also structure it by, by work packages. So for example, let's look at the five tasks that you have under integration testing. Let's look at the seven tasks that you have under acceptance testing. Let's look at the three tasks that you have under um, non-functional testing. And so JIRA really allows to structure the tasks in many different visualizations. I'm going to show you some of these visualizations. Um, another good question, I'm really sorry, I cannot answer all the questions. I promise that I'll try to answer as many as possible. How do you handle ad hoc action items? Do you use an action tracker? No, we use JIRA. Mm -hmm. We use JIRA for everything. This is what I like about JIRA, you know, in the old days, you had 27 different Excels. For, you had an, um, a risk Excel or risk action Excel. You had a to-do list for your meeting. You had, a, um, you had your project schedule, your tasks in MS Project. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted Jira, because I can put everything in one tool, no matter where it comes from. Um, and with the filter, I can filter some things out. So not everything is put in a in a sprint i only put those things in a sprint which are of relevance for for the core team and the other things are filtered out with other filters for example everything for the testing team and then that, that is much more granular um and here's a question from Tommaso, and then i would like to move on what is the difference between structure.gant and jira roadmaps um, it's two different add-ins. I had a look at Jira roadmaps once. I don't know if, if you can do GAN charts, I'm afraid. My impression was that it's more, um, yeah, that it's more in a, in a, how do you call that, in a more an agile roadmap thing, you know. But on my other project, we are using big picture which is also an, um, an, an add-in to JIRA. The big picture has many different features and one of the features is also a GAN chart. So maybe we could also use a, a GAN chart. Uh, we could also use big picture. Okay, let me move on. Um, and then we come to executing work during the sprint. So the team performs the work and they update the issues in JIRA. And this is the main reason why I wanted JIRA and not MS Project. You know, in the old days, I did not want anyone to touch my MS Project file because they would certainly screw something up. So MS Project, well, the version that I know is a centralistic tool. You know, so it, it should only be handled by one person or very few people. And while JIRA is a collaboration tool, so when the team works with JIRA, they change the status, they add comments, they add mention each other, they add attachment, uh, they add links. And um, so they really use this for working together. We have, I said before, we have our weekly core team meeting. So every Monday morning we meet. And I prepare that core team meeting very thoroughly. So I go through everything, everything which is on the scrum board and I take notes where I would like to dig deeper, where uh, dates um, are approaching or are getting overdue. And um, for the, then in the core team, we go through again, a core team meeting, we go through again, the same action uh, information, but using yet another view. And here we use the scrum board. Um, and what I like about the scrum board is that it's two-dimensional. So it's much easier to, to understand visually where you are than when you have an, uh, a to-do list in Excel. Um, so for example, let's look at what the testing team is doing. So you can see they have a few deliverables which are upcoming. Um, this one is due tomorrow. That's why it has this blue bar here. That's a nice customization feature in the Scrum board. But they also have a few other tasks to do. Some of them have a due date and some of them are just things that they are working on. 
which don't have a due date yet. And what I also like about this is that I can filter, for example, I can filter just for the deliverables or I can filter for tasks which are overdue. And as you can see, the testing team luckily has no overdue tasks, but some of the other teams do. And I also think it's much more satisfying to see your task when it's complete, see the card being moved from the to-do column to the done column, than just changing the status in an Excel sheet of a row from open to closed. Now, again, let's think about it. Is this rather, um, I'm always moving the wrong window. Why do I do this? I wanted to move this window, okay. Okay, is this approach rather waterfall or is it rather agile? Now in pure waterfall, as I said, it was only the project manager that was managing the tool. And you have weekly quarterly meeting, tasks have due dates. While in pure agile, all the team members are working with the tool. You have your daily stand-up meetings and stories have a sprint. And please reflect, you know, do you think we are rather in the waterfall space or rather in the agile space? And my take is I think here's where it gets hybrid. Because um, tasks can have due dates or sprints. Um, we, are we are working with a tool which is usually only used in Agile, but we don't do dailies. Um, I think here's where we are mixing to th the, the two methodologies. So let me have a look at the, let me have a look at the Q&A. Thank you very much for your question. Okay, ah, Jim Green, hi Jim. Jim is asking, sorry if the screen keeps jumping here. Yeah, um, is your, where's that question from Jim, went away. Oh, is your team working in a typical agile mode with daily stand-up meetings and a scrum master working to smooth the path ahead of them or are they working in a more traditional way? Excellent question. This, these teams are working in a completely traditional way. Uh, in my other projects, we have, my other project, we have two scrum teams with uh, scrum masters and product owners, release train engineers, product managers, we have um, sprints and product iterations, and that works very well because there we develop the software ourselves. But this, here, this is a um, really very traditional way of doing the project. Uh, question from Juan, did you change your mind about JIRA regarding their new pricing policies? Um, for those that are not familiar with it, uh, JIRA changed the, the hosting and the pricing um, or announced that they're going to change that, uh, which makes JIRA more expensive to use. That's currently also a big topic for my company. Um, I don't know what they are going to do if they are just going to swallow the increased costs or if they are going to reduce something. What I do know is that they are already very restrictive when it comes to add-ins because they always have a price, but license fee plus maintenance cost. Um, but you know, my take is, you know, that that's a tool. We need to have good tools, you know. And you cannot build a house with only shovels, you know. So you need the big machinery. You need the excavators. And for me, Jira is is a tool that we should just have even if it, if it has its price. Okay, let me move on. I have a bit of buffer at the end where I can um, come back to the questions that I did not answer. Next step is the sprint end and the demo. So I close the sprint in Jira, which means that the closed tasks are automatically removed from the scrum board thereby um, also reducing complexity. 
and then we prepare the demo agenda. And we demo everything. You know? So usually uh, it's software that it's demoed, but in our project, we really demo everything. So every stream that you saw in the org chart is demoing something. So we demo documents. You know? Somebody might give us a walkthrough through some concept. We demo architecture drawings. We demo uh, performance measurement tools. And of course, we also demo running software, either the one that we developed ourselves or the testers might demo uh, packages which they have received from, from NASDAQ and which they have uh, tested. And they show us what, what's, what's working in the, in the system. And my experience with these demos is that the, the teams are very happy to demo, you know, because they like to show what they have done, what they like to show what they have completed in the last uh, sprint or what they've been working on over a long time and now finally completed. And they always get very positive feedback from the others. So the demos also have the purpose of keeping everyone informed. You know? So I have seen demos of risk methodologies, documents, long word documents with highly complicated formulas. I thought my head would explode, but now I know what these risk guys are doing. You know? I don't understand it, but I appreciate what they're doing and I know how that contributes to the project. And everybody's showing each other what we are doing. And so we have a very good cohesion. We have a very good understanding of what everyone is working on. And again, let's pause here, you know, and reflect, is that approach rather waterfall or is it rather agile? Now in pure waterfall, you would maybe have an occasional demo of a prototype and you would demo the solution before go live, usually. And in pure agile, you will have regular demos. That's part of the agile way of running a project. And the purpose of the demo is to get the approval for delivered or for software ready for delivery from the product owner and the stakeholder and usually only demo software. And please reflect, you know, do you think this is rather inspired by um, Pure Waterfall or is it rather inspired by Agile? So my take of this is, I think this is now more Agile, you know? So here we have really taken Agile practices and, and brought them into our way of, of managing the project. But we are not completely agile because um, we don't demo to stakeholders. Well, actually, the, some of the main stakeholders are working in the project. So the head of the team that is in the future going to use that software, that tool, that the application that we are developing is the head of our VA team. And so he can very well assess if that meets his requirements or not. And um, and, and we demo everything. So we demo not just software. So we are not, as I said, we are not totally, totally um, agile. Um, let's take a short pause for questions. I have a few new ones. Oh, good question from Matthew. Thank you, Matthew Price. Is there a difference between the Scrum board and Kanban? Um, for that, Matthew, if you're interested, I can recommend another channel on YouTube. It is called Development That Pays by a British Scrum Master. He has some really cool videos where, for example, he also explains the difference between Scrum Board and Kanban. Um, and a Scrum Board is something that you load with tasks and at the end of the time frame, and, and it has a, a time frame one week, two weeks, three weeks. And at the end of that time frame, the Scrum board should be empty. So or actually everything should be on the leftmost column. So all the tasks should be complete. And then you go to your backlog and according to priorities, you take the next tasks and put them into the, the Scrum board and repeat the same cycle. While the Kanban board is something which is permanently on and you just move your 
tasks through the board. So for example, the Kanban board might be very useful for, um, for a help desk where things are coming in and you prioritize them and then you move them through the different steps until they are definitely uh, complete. Um, question from Georgiana. Thank you. If you would not have the option of using JIRA, what would you have used for the same project instead of JIRA? I think there are other tools similar to JIRA. Um, I have to admit, I only know JIRA and Microsoft Project and Excel, of course, so I don't know any of the others. But I think I would have looked at some of the uh, web-based tools with, with, where you pay by user and um, which are hosted in the cloud and which can do similar things. Of course, after a while you reach, uh, you reach a limit, but um, I think for smaller teams that can be very useful as well. Question from Nicole. Hello, Nicole. Um, I like the idea of demoing everything. How long does your demo session usually take and who attends the demo? The demo, we have a demo every three weeks. The demo usually takes um, one hour, one and a half hour. We have between one and four topics per demo. It's the core team that attends and the core team are the heads of these, um, of these streams that you saw in the org chart. Sometimes when we have a, a new delivery from NASDAQ, a new package, then we invite future users as well. So we invite people from the business operations team um, or from the help desk to see what they are going to get. And now I'm afraid I need to move on. So the last step then is the retrospective. Um, retrospective, so I prepare a retro board. We use an online tool. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Then we jointly do a retrospective. We define the actions. We add the action as JIRA issues to the next sprint and we track the execution of the actions. The last point is very important because I, I told you I'm also working in another project. And in that other project, we didn't do demos. Uh, sorry, we didn't do retros. And I realized that there was some dissatisfaction among the team members. So I motivated the project management to do retros. And, but then nothing happened with what was said in these retros. And again, uh, the team members were dissatisfied. So I motivated the project management to track the execution of the actions. And now they are part of our, you know, the actions are coming out of the retros are part of our weekly management meetings. So we look at them all the time and the team members trust, have to trust that when they raise an issue that is going to be addressed. We cannot solve all the issues immediately, but at least then they know that somebody is taking care of it. And um, we have definitely improved the way that project runs thanks to the actions coming out of that retro. And again, you know, is this approach rather waterfall or is it rather agile? In pure waterfall, we know the concept of lesson learned and they are usually done at the end of a phase and the emphasis is on documentation of lesson learned. So <coughs> at Credit Suisse, we used to have a lesson learned database, which even won an award somewhere. Um, but let's be honest, I mean, nobody ever looks at a lesson learned database. So that's why we call this database our lessons find database. While in Pure Agile, you have a retrospective after every sprint and the emphasis is on the immediate implementation of actions. And let's reflect, you know, is what we are doing here in the NCP project, is that rather inspired by Waterfall or is it rather inspired by Agile? And my take of this is, I think here's where we definitely got some very, very valuable inspiration from, um, from say the practices which are very common in Agile. And I like to do retrospectives. We had retrospectives on management meetings. You know, how do you like how this management meeting is organized? 
we do retrospectives in that other project on our PR planning workshops. And we have definitely improved the way we are running these workshops thanks to the feedback. And also we do retrospectives after sprints, of course. I looked at the history of our retrospectives in the project and um, draw this little uh, graph. Um, and I just counted the number of statements. And what you can see, well, here we had two retrospectives on paper with flip chart, but we are distributed. So we used the video cameras, which was very difficult. Um, and uh, then we found this online tool that I'm going to show in a minute. And um, first retro was still a bit, people were a bit hesitant and struggle with the tool. And then in the second retro, really the like the floodgates broke open. So a lot of things were said, a um, lot of things to change. And what is interesting is if you look at the evolution over time, you see the number of went well going up and you see the number of to improve going down to a point where here we actually stopped having demos. Uh, sorry, having retros because we simply ran out of ideas. We are in such a steady mode that, and it's same every week, every sprint, that we are not doing demos anymore. We will relaunch it next month because now we are in a testing phase. We are approaching go live, so we have new topics to talk about, and then we will have uh, uh, demos again. I would like to show you some statements from the demos, uh, some actual statements. Uh, that one was from me, well, being a scheduler, was not happy with how we looked at the, the due dates. And so we paid more attention to these due dates. Uh, Rico was of the opinion that the requirements meetings are too short, so we uh, made them longer and increased the frequency. Rico also thought that architecture has not enough attention, so we introduced a weekly architecture meeting. And then we also had positive statements coming. Rolf was impressed with the progress in the settlement engine. Okay, here's one I screwed up. I sent half of the team members uh, for a meeting in one room and the other half into the other room. John was unhappy and he expressed that in a retro. And um, yeah, he's right, point taken. From then on, I paid more attention to my invitations. And we have positive statements like communication is working well and um, great demo. So here I merged a few statements into one car. Uh, very positive feedback to, from everyone to, to the teams that have uh, given uh, demos. I mentioned before that we are uh, using a tool. So the tool is called Easy Retro. Uh, there are other similar tools as well. Easy Retro is just the one that we selected. And the way the process works, um, we're going to, I'm going to show you that in a minute, is the team posts the statements. What went well was is to improve. Um, you optionally can group the statements if there are too many. And um, then we vote on the most relevant statements. We select the actions and we add the actions or define actions for the next sprint. EasyRetro.io is, uh, by the way, free up to three boards, and then there is a monthly or an annual um, fee. And just then, just to you know, complete the cycle or continue the cycle, we of course always add more details to the schedule. So rolling wave planning. Uh, right now, we are adding more details to the testing phase, and then. The thing starts again, so I look at the list view and select the tasks for the next uh, sprint and start the sprint. And um, I told you before that the reason why you're doing this is because the project manager wants it again, chart. But fun fact is that the Gantt view is only used to build the schedule. Over the course of the project, we never look at the Gantt chart anymore. The, our tool to manage the tasks is really the, uh, the Scrum board. Now, I have to correct what I just said. I gave that presentation about three months ago at an internal conference. And back then, that was true. But 
three days later, the project manager came to me and said, um, Martin, there's an area in the schedule where I don't have an overview. Um, and I think there I need a timeline. So here's what I built for him. So here's the, um, these are the tasks. Uh, there are some functional definition tasks and they usually go through a, a writing phase and then a sign off, which you can see as a milestone. We have some tasks where we don't have a date yet. So, and you can see this is very difficult to understand. So what I did is I built this scan chart and added a button here, which allows me to sort. And now the project manager can see how many and which tasks are overdue and which are the next one in line. Though, but this is really the only area where we still use a can chart. And again, I moved the wrong window. I wanted to move this one. Okay. Okay, I need to skip the Q&A here. I have a Q&A at the end of, the, of my time. Um, let me say a few words about retrospectives. If you're interested in retrospectives, there is a recorded webinar on projectmanagement.com on retrospectives. It was um, held in February 2020 by an experienced Scrum Master, and she um, shared some best practices on uh, retrospectives. And she also showed various way of doing ways of doing retrospectives. For the PMI members, access to projectmanagement.com is free. There are about 2,000 recorded webinars, plus articles, white papers, whatever, wealth of information. And I can really recommend that specific webinar. Um, coming back to what I said in the beginning, you know, why did I want to have that presentation? I think good scheduling and also good tracking brings much stability and also fun to the project. So our core team meetings are very, very uh, efficient and people really like to attend our core team meetings, which is, you know, you can't say about many meetings these days. I think there is no need to be dogmatic. It is very well possible to blend traditional and agile approaches. JIRA as a tool can also be used for traditional projects if you have that again adding. The approach is simple, it helps you manage complexity and practices like sprints, demos and retros are very valuable also for traditional projects. Now I'd like to ask another uh, question to the audience. Do you, you, do you do regular retrospectives in your team or in your organization? And Pia, can you help me with this as well? Can you? Yeah, it's already on. Okay. Okay, uh, interesting. So you regularly do retrospectives. Okay, but we still have quite a big share which rarely does a retrospective or which has never done a retrospective. Okay, so let me pause here. Um, well, then I invite you to do a retro together now. Mm -hmm. um, so, and thereby I can also sh sh show you the tool that we are using. So I've prepared a retro board. Um, please go to bit.ly slash easy retro. And the question that I have for you is in three weeks time, I will give the same presentation again to a different audience. What should I do again? And what should I change? So here's the board that I prepared. Um, yep, Pia has also posted the link in the chat. So here's the board that I prepared and the way to post something is you click on plus and then you write something in, you know, for example, you could say speak 
slower and then click on add. Okay. So please keep the, um, the feedback coming. Click on the plus and add what you think I should do again and what I should uh, change. Cool, thank you very much. Thank you for the many statements. Okay, please don't forget the change, um, the change column. <laughs> okay, very cool, thank you very much. Okay, let's keep this running for another minute, uh, for a few seconds. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I, after my last presentation, I did the same and that provided me with some very valuable feedback. Let's stop here. I think you got the, I think you got the idea and how that tool works. Let's go to the next step. So what I would now do is I would group similar statements. So you just take one statement and drop it on top of the other and they will be merged, which I don't want to do here. Um, now let's vote. So what I will do is I will give each of you two votes and you can vote by clicking on the thumbs up. So please let me know which of these statements do you think are the most relevant ones? Which are the ones which have the highest relevance? So click on the thumbs up uh, icon, please. Okay, so please do the voting. I see the numbers going up. By the way, I also like web-based um, retros over retros in a room because you always in your team you have say more timid people and um, they don't like to stand in front of their colleagues with a card in their hand and stating what they think should be changed um, but here they they can just enter that very quietly so i think it's it really um it includes everyone okay good let's let's stop here let's move on i think you got the idea let's move on to the next um phase now um, I'm going to, that was the wrong click. I'm going to add another column. I'm going to call it actions. Okay, and now let me look at the statements with the highest number of votes. So that's one that has six. That has, oops, that was wrong. I want to grab this card here. Okay, then I have keep the content, thank you very much, and so on. You know. So this is what we did at the end of a, um, of a retro. So we selected the ones with the highest number of votes, and then this was input for the next uh, sprint. And sometimes, yeah, statements from the project manager were not selected. So obviously the team members did not share his concern or his opinion. He could come back after the next retro. Sometimes my statements were not selected. I think it's a very democratic way of, of um, you know, improving the, the project. Okay, so thank you very much for doing that retro with me and thank you very much for the valuable feedback. So let me move, yeah. Let me move that window away if I manage to grab the, the right one. Okay, where's my PowerPoint? Okay, here it is, good. Okay, I have um, close to five minutes for questions. So let me look at a few questions here. A question from Patrick, are you still running STCs in your project? Yes, we do. We just had one this afternoon. Um, and also in the, by the way, in the other project that is really agile with uh, sprints and um, product increments. And so we have a steering committee. So 
in my opinion, it's, it's a complete illusion in a large organization with projects to do away with steering committees and to think that the, you could invite your sponsor to the demo and to the PR planning and that's all that they need. I think that's okay if you manage to say convert a department into a, uh, which I call a software factory, you know, where you don't have projects with a start and an end, uh, but where you have like a constant stream of functionality and churning out functionality is the only thing that you do. You know? So if you're a company like say uh, Digitech Galoxus in Switzerland, um, or you're a company or you are a, uh, I don't know, you're maintaining your Tagesan Tiger website, you know, there you have a constant stream and you don't have project with a start and an end, but we have project with a start and an end. So all our projects still have project boards. Um, question from Michelle. Um, do you keep the scrum rule to demo only finished results? If not, how do you decide, how do you decide what is ready to be demonstrated? Yes, sort of, because you know the streams demo when they have something ready. So, but they might demo a, as I said, they might demo a, a document when it's done, or they might demo um, an architecture concept when it's done. Uh, question from Ricardo, how do you track the financial aspects of the project? Baseline, ETC, um, cost variance. See, cost variance, yes. Um, tracking financial very traditionally, you know, so the, well, the, the budget is basically defined by, or the cost that we are going to have is defined by the resources that we have. And um, we do our monthly reviews um, of financial. So that's nothing different from a traditional project. Okay, um, I have two more minutes. I'm afraid I need to stop here. But as I said, I'm going to try to respond to as many questions as possible. Um, if you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn, feel free to do so. Um, and now I'd like to hand back to the team. I'd like to hand back to Chris. And I would like to thank them very much for their support. The Switzerland chapter really has a great event team, um, has a great virtual event team, which is new and um, was very supportive and helpful. And I'm very happy that the uh, Dark Angel of Demos did not visit us today. So Chris, thank you and back to you. Very good. So thank you, uh, Martin. That really was an excellent, excellent event. Uh, so you. could we move to the next, please? Yes. So uh, I would also like to thank our other supporters from the volunteer team at PMI Switzerland. So Prasanth is the leader of the Zurich events team. Then we have uh, Pia and Isatu uh, from the virtual team that really, uh, they are the experts at making the virtual events happen. For our upcoming events, on the 5th of February, we have PMI Coffee Talk. And then on the 11th, a virtual uh, annual member meeting that Stefan had introduced before. The future of work is human. Uh, then we have an open space on the 23rd around the theme of PMP fundamentals. On the, on the 3rd of March, on the 2nd of March is introduction to disciplined agile. And then there is a masterclass in April that will actually be in person. So hopefully that will, that will happen. That is on the 17th of April. And the theme is building your personal brand. And looking further into the future, on September 29th, 2021, is expected to be the 10th PMI Switzerland conference with the theme, Innovation in Project Management, Expertise for Changing Times. And this brings us to the last slide. We would appreciate very much if everyone could 
please answer our very, very short five minute survey. Uh, so there is a link and you can use this uh, QR code. And because this is a free event, uh, PMI Switzerland or PMI members are responsible for claiming uh, their own PDUs for this event. So this is the this is the code that you would use to claim the PDU. So with that, I will thank uh, Martin one more time. It was an excellent, excellent talk, and I found it to be extremely helpful. Uh, we will have slides and a link where we will post the video to share with you shortly. And with that, I will wish everyone a good night. Good night.